President Trump's decision to withdraw from the Iranian nuclear deal. And imposing tough new sanctions on Iran instead. The president gives some companies up to six months to wind down involvement with Iran. When the United States violated the Iran nuclear deal, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It was actually the result of a lobbying campaign backed by some of the richest people in the U.S. These are people that have uh, really extreme views when it comes to Iran, and there's ample evidence that they are willing to use their money to further their anti-Iran views. When President Trump withdrew the U.S. from the historic Iran nuclear deal in May 2018, he actually undid years of diplomatic efforts that reset the U.S.-Iran relationship, which, prior to that, had been non-existent since Iran's 1979 revolution. It also unraveled one of the Obama administration's signature foreign policy achievements and went against the U.S.'s European allies. The collapse of the Iran deal is a catastrophic missed opportunity for diplomacy. I think that, that this decision is going to be viewed similar to the decision to invade Iraq in 2003. So how exactly did this happen? Hi guys, I'm Omar, and this Sunday we're talking about how major lobbying efforts orchestrated by corporate billionaires led to the U.S.'s violation of the Iran nuclear deal. Okay, before we get into the why, where, and how, let's make sure we got the basics down. In 2015, Iran reached an agreement on its nuclear program with the P5 plus one, otherwise known as the US, Russia, France, the UK, China, and Germany. The agreement severely restricted Iran's ability to enrich uranium. It also ensured for the first time that Iran would not seek a nuclear weapon, something it had already once pledged to do. It's a historic agreement uh, involving the US, Iran, uh, and other world powers in which sanctions were exchanged for caps on Iran's nuclear program and strict inspections to verify that Iran was not uh, moving towards the nuclear weapons capability. But behind the scenes, there was a furious stash of lobbying involving nearly $150 million and a large group of organizations working nonstop to kill the deal in Congress. But who exactly were these groups? We spoke to Eli Clifton, who's reported extensively on them and their activities. A unifying message that seemed to be coming out of groups opposing the Iran deal was a series of talking points talking about Iran's a hegemonic ambitions in the region and threat to U.S. regional allies like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. At the forefront of the fight was APAC, or the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. It aggressively advocated that the deal was a bad idea that would hurt Israel and U.S. interests. APAC spent approximately $30 million on their campaign through a subsidiary group known as Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Iran. This included political ads on TV, flying in APAC members to DC to lobby members of Congress, and organizing demonstrations. Check out this ad by Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Iran. Iran has violated 20 international agreements and is the leading state sponsor of terrorism. APAC incidentally didn't originally want to be involved in this policy battle, but was pushed into it by their backers and funders and ended up very much giving voice to Israeli concerns, possibly at the expense of a discussion about American interests in the region. But APAC wasn't alone. The Republican Jewish Coalition, Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, United Against Nuclear Iran, and the Israeli American Council all opposed the agreement. Altogether, opposition groups were five times better funded than their opponents supporting the deal. The groups opposing the nuclear deal went into this with an enormous financial advantage. All of them were pre-existing in Washington. All of them were well funded by Republican, uh, and in case of AIPAC, Republican and Democrat uh, donors. Back in 2015, Jamal Abdi was working with the National Iranian American Council to make the Iran deal a reality. As we were advocating for this, we knew the other side was pushing back hard and they weren't going anywhere. You know, they lost because the White House was able to pull this off and we were able to help put enough pressure on Congress that they didn't kill the deal. If you're wondering where this windfall of anti-deal money and support for anti-deal groups came from, the answer is billionaires. And Sheldon Adelson tops the list of names funding these groups. Adelson has been at the forefront of financially supporting Republican causes and pro-Israel initiatives for decades. Uh, Sheldon Adelson and his wife Miriam are the Republican Party's biggest donors. They were uh, also Donald Trump's single bat largest backers in his campaign efforts in 2016. That's something we often forget. The Las Vegas billionaire even said that an atomic weapon should be fired at Iran. 
So there's an atomic weapon goes over ballistic missiles in the middle of the, middle of the desert that doesn't hurt a soul. Maybe a couple of rattlesnakes and scorpions or whatever. And then you, and then you say, see, the next one is in the middle of Tehran. Adelson has contributed millions of dollars to groups lobbying against the Iran deal. This includes half a million dollars to United Against Nuclear Iran, one and a half million dollars to the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, and ten million dollars to the Israeli American Council. He also happens to be a board member of the Republican Jewish Coalition and likely its largest financier. According to Eli Clifton, the RJC's 2012 contributions showed one large donation of over five million dollars from an unnamed donor. Beyond Adelson, there's also Home Depot co-founder Bernard Marcus, who's also donated millions to anti-Iran groups. Listen to what he says about Iran in this 2015 interview. When you do business with the devil, you're in deep trouble, and I think that Iran is the devil. Marcus gave more than $10 million to the Hawkish Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or FDD, between 2008 and 2011, and over $3 million in 2015. And APAC, which we told you about earlier, he's given millions to them as well. There's one more donor you should know about. Paul Singer is a hedge fund billionaire who donated over three and a half million dollars to the FDD in 2011 and one and a half million dollars to APAC between 2010 and 2011. But despite the best efforts and deep pockets of the anti-Iran deal lobbyists, they were unable to defeat the Iran deal in Congress in 2015. So in 2016, the coalition and their billionaire backers tried a different approach. Donald J. Trump. Never ever ever in my life have I seen any transaction so incompetently negotiated as our deal with Iran. But we knew that once a new president came in, once the circumstances changed, there was going to be all this money sort of on the table in place to try to kill the deal and if not kill the deal, at least contain it. Adelson, Marcus and Singer spent a lot of money to help elect Donald Trump. Combined, they donated $40 million to pro-Trump political groups. They also worked to ensure he'd have a strong Congress to support him by spending $65 million backing Republican candidates in the House and Senate. So when you have three billionaires who prioritize based off of their public, private, as well as their philanthropic uh, efforts and comments, opposing the nuclear deal and the United States uh, pursuing a hawkish policy, it's a series of policies in the Middle East, it's hard to imagine that any Republican candidate doesn't listen very carefully to what these individuals have to say. Fast forward to early 2018, Trump is president and hasn't yet reneged on the Iran deal as he'd pledged during his campaign. He'd actually renewed it more than once. But John Bolton, Trump's national security advisor, would change that. John Bolton had been George W. Bush's ambassador to the UN. He was known as a vocal proponent of the Iraq war, an open advocate of war with Iran, and a longtime critic of the Iran nuclear deal. There's a lot we can do and we should do it. Our goal should be regime change in Iran. And according to Politico, Trump's chief of staff, John Kelly, had cut the president's interactions with Bolton prior to him joining the administration because of his fringe views. Enter Sheldon Adelson. By multiple accounts, Sheldon Adelson is a big fan of John Bolton. Adelson made sure to get Trump to listen to Bolton. And with Bolton back in Trump's ear, his influence on the president was felt almost instantly. Just four weeks after Bolton assumed the role of national security advisor, the U.S. violated the terms of the Iran deal. The fact is, this was a horrible, one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. It didn't bring calm. It didn't bring peace, and it never will. So money was a key factor in the campaign against a diplomatic breakthrough between two countries that hadn't managed to agree on anything for decades. All these groups with all these vested interests kept busy and their, their you know, moneyed interests and constituencies stayed active, and they ended up winning in the end. But where do the United States and Iran go from here? Well, Iran is seeking to keep the deal alive between itself and European powers without the United States. And if that were to fail, can we expect the huge influence of anti-Iran groups in the U.S. to lead us to war? There's a real opportunity for the United States and Iran to wind up in a direct, uh, heated conflict with one another. We're going to need to have more hearings and more public awareness of the risk of that war and create legal and political barriers to an eventual war and the means to escalate to that war. So what did you guys think? Were you guys aware that corporate billionaires had basically demolished the Iran deal? 
Let us know in the comments about other stories that you'd like us to report on. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.